Okay. Okay. So uh, hi everyone. So uh, about three years ago, right? I gave this talk right here at Junadev. I know how many of you remember this, but I wrote a Slack client for Windows 3.1. You can see the date there. Okay. So ever since then, right, I thought whether it's possible to write for a platform that's older than Windows 3.1. Okay. So just March last last month, right? ChatGPT released their APIs. Okay. So many people have written apps using those APIs, right? Someone has even written a, a user, created a smartwatch, right? Based on that. So I thought, right, since other people can do this, why not I can do something about it also? And I created a DOS client, okay? I uh, created the app, I open sourced it, I wrote a blog post on it, and I was honestly surprised by the international attention I got from this. So I'm not sure how many of you have seen it, but yeah, you can see uh, this is Ask Technica, this is Hackerday slash dot, and even Chinese website CSD and the two Japanese sites, okay? Gigazine and PC Watch. So yeah, so I got people requested me, okay, please give a talk about this, this app. What is this app about? So yeah, here I am to give a talk about this. Okay, so some background. This app is not just any other chat GPT client. It's running on this old PC. This is what's my target platform, okay? So, and this PC, you can see the date, uh, is released in 1984, okay? With these specifications, okay? This CPU is not a typo, uh. it's not gigahertz, it's megahertz, uh, 4.77. Uh. And the memory here is not measured by gigabytes, it's not even measured by megabytes, it's measured by kilobytes uh, of RAM, uh. okay? And you can see the graphics here. This graphics card, right, can only output this resolution. And the higher, more resolution you want, right, the less colors you can support. <laughs> okay, and it's a network card and it's run, running MS DOS 6.22. And it weighs 14 kilos. Uh. That's the reason I'm not bringing it here. <laughs> okay, so don't let this name fool you. It's not portable at all. It's more like a luggable PC. Okay, so before that, a short history lesson. Okay, because I'm sure many of you may not even know what is this PC about. Okay, so before the IBM 5155, right, there's this PC called the IBM 5150, called the IBM PC. Personal computer released in 1981. Okay, why so special about this computer? It's because most of our computers today are descendants of this computer. Right? See, descendants of the x86 IBM PC are the 64-bit computers x86, 64, and AMD 64. So most of our laptops and desktops today are actually descendants of this. They can, the lineage can be traced back to this computer. Okay, so this PC with these specifications, right? In 1981. Then shortly after this, right, IBM released two PCs, the 51660 in March of 1983, and this one also, 5155. So notice that all these three, right, they're using the same CPU. Right? So you can treat, or, treat the, all these three roughly of the same generation. Then only, a, only the next one in August 1984, there's, some, there's a PC called 5170. So that is when the CPU has upgraded to 286, 8 megahertz. Uh. Okay, it's a massive change at that time. Right? Today is nothing. Uh. Okay. <laughs> And notice here, right, it doesn't have hard disk. Uh. So hard disk is not a requirement at that time. Uh. It's not a given at that time also. Okay, so what about DOS? Okay, so DOS is an operating system that's older than many of you here. It's even older than me also. So yeah, so it's, it's a very, very old OS. So this is a brief history. So we know today as DOS being created by Microsoft. But actually Microsoft did not create it. Okay, so the... The, it started off from a company called Digital Research. They create something called CPM to run on this even older Intel CPU, 8-bit. Then after that, Seattle Computer Products cloned this, and then they call it 86 DOS, okay, in 1980. After that, Microsoft purchased 86 DOS and they renamed it to MS DOS. Okay? Then after that, uh, IBM licensed it from Microsoft and they call it PC DOS. So there are a few acronyms here. So you can see here, PC DOS 1981. So IBM licensed it because they need an OS to run on this PC. Okay? So they call it PC DOS. And along the way there were many iterations. Uh. So the final release of, of MS DOS is 6.22 in 1994, which is the one that uh, I, I'm using on my IBM PC and my on my demo today. Okay, so after DOS, then came Windows. So we, most of us we started using Windows, but that's not the first thing. So the first one was actually DOS, then it came Windows and Windows, all these versions. So all these versions of Windows, they are called 16-bit DOS-based, Windows 1, Windows 2, Windows 3, and then Windows 9X. 
So 95, 98, M, 98 SC, ME, I count Windows 9X. These are 32 bit OS. Okay, so along the tail end of the Windows 9X era, Microsoft released Windows NT and all this. So all until Windows 11 today, right? All these are the NT line. Okay, this line is gone already. Okay, so this gives you the rough, rough timeline of these operating systems. Okay, so for the demo today, right? Uh, I don't have that IBM PC, so I'll be using a, a laptop. This laptop is not as old, uh, it's 996. Uh, okay, it's still old. Uh, okay, <laughs> so you can see the specifications here. Wow, it's very old, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, then it has a floppy drive and a CD ROM drive. Uh. No, uh, laptops with this is not common. Uh. And when I say floppy drive, uh, this is uh, floppy disk. Uh. I like, pass around in case some of you never see before. Yeah. <laughs> this is the OG safe button. <laughs> Okay, so this computer, right, I dual boot it with DOS, Windows 3.1, and Windows 98. But for this demo, I'll use the DOS 6.22. Okay, so what about networking, right? Notice that I never even mentioned any networking capabilities of this <coughs> PC. Because this PC, by default, doesn't have any networking capabilities. It does not have Wi-Fi, obviously. It does not have Ethernet. So how, right? There's something called a PC card. Uh. PC MCI, you may not have heard of this. Uh. Those of the older generation. Yeah. Okay, so this is a card, you slot it in, then with the dongle, right, you have internet access. And this is 10 megabit only. Uh. It's not 100 megabit, it's not even gigabit. Okay, then after that, right, I have a wireless ethernet bridge. So this one converts the, the internet to Wi-Fi, and it connects to my iPad, which is acting as a hotspot. So adapter after adapter, right, to get to the internet. Okay, so let's have a quick demo here. Okay, so in this setup, right, I'm running my this Toshiba PC here, and then uh, I'm streaming the over a HDMI capture card to this to my modern PC. So what you're seeing is what what you're seeing there is what I'm looking at here right now. Okay, so to launch my app here, right, I just launch this one. Okay, then start. Okay, then I just type hi. Hope this works. Okay, can. Okay, so let's ask. Let me ask a question. Uh. see, maybe I ask, what is Junior Dev, SG, see what ChatGPT says. <laughs> takes a while, right? But even on the website, it takes a while, right? Okay, uh, so you can read there. So let me type another question there. Maybe I should ask, who found it? <laughs> Is it? No, all right. I, it's not correct, right, Michael? You check, Michael, you double check. <laughs> not correct, right? Yeah, so chat GPT is not always correct, uh, as you all know. Uh. Okay? Yeah, so let me get back to the presentation. So don't trust chat GPT for everything. Okay, so how did I make this app? Okay, so uh, the first thing when it comes to making an app is you need to find a compiler, right? So the compiler that I use for this is called OpenWorkCom. Okay, so OpenWorkCom is uh, it's actually a compiler with a very long history. Okay, so it is actually even used by the makers of Doom. You may heard of this game called Doom, right? Doom was compiled by an earlier version of this compiler, an earlier iteration. Okay, and uh, the one I'm using is called it's a fork, lah. So that it has a 32-bit version and 64-bit version. So it actually can run on my modern PC. It can generate a 16-bit DOS binary, okay? And the text editor I use, we just do the code, just as per normal. So to compile it, right, it actually is quite modern, you know. It has, it can support a make file, like this. And all I need to do to compile, right, is just like this. And then it generates a binary here already. Then I, I just need to, yeah, I need to use the binary. So, but the problem is the binary cannot be run on a modern Windows operating system. Because modern 64-bit Windows OS, right, cannot run 16-bit programs. You can, you can compile it, but you cannot use it, okay? Okay, so how to test, right? So I test using a VM, okay? So I use a virtual box, okay? So I just transform my binary inside, then I just run it inside. Okay, this, so this is easier to test. So instead of having to compile already, then transfer manually to the OPC, right? It's a bit troublesome, so I test locally first, uh, okay? So using, uh, using VirtualBox. Also, I use another emulator called 86box. 
because 86 box uh, is emulator I think most of you would not know. So it actually emulates the, the OPCs to a much more accurate level than what VirtualBox can do. Okay, so you can see, right, this O1, let me open 86 box. Okay, so I have here over here. Okay, so we can see, right, this 86 box, right, okay, it has the ability, right, to emulate many retro PCs. Right, even by the machine type, by the CPU type, you select CPU type, then for this CPU type, are so many PCs. So it's a good way to test your app on it. Lah. Okay, you can even set the very low memory counts, you know, you can even set the 1 to 128 KB. Okay, so VirtualBox, you cannot set a RAM that low. The lowest you can set on VirtualBox is 4 megabytes. Yeah, so this one can. Okay, so what about architecture? Okay, so uh, DOS, right, by default, it does not have networking API. So, in fact, the first version of Windows that have networking API is Windows 3.1. So, if you want to go further back, we don't have. So, it's a bit of a problem, but there's something called a packet driver API. So, packet driver API is invented, was invented by MIT in 1983. So, this is the... So, okay, how it works is that to use this API, a network kind manufacturer needs to make this driver for you. Okay? So, if this driver, once it's started, it will become something called a terminal and stay resident program. This is actually a technical term, a DOS technical term. So, a program that launches and stays in the, back, stays in the background. Then, when you want to talk to the network card, right, the app developer, which is like me in this case, I would need to talk to this packet driver over that, that API, which is agreed upon. Then, the packet driver will then talk to the network card. Okay. Okay, so this packet driver interface is actually very low level. But thankfully, right, there's a library called MTCP. So MTCP is actually an extremely modern library. Okay, so it implements normal socket APIs like send and receive. Okay, send and receive is actually very low level in today's context already. But in the DOS case, right, send, having send and receive is very high level already. Okay, so this started by this guy called Michael Brotman. Okay. So this is not his day job. His day job is a uh, Google SRE, uh, okay? Then he sees his current version now, March 31st, eh? very recent only, right? He frequently maintains this DOS library. Okay? And his website is hosted on this OPC also. <laughs> okay, very impressive, guy. Okay, so I use his library. Then next come the API for ChatGPT. Okay, so ChatGPT, they were very, their documentation is really good. They give you a curl example, okay, how to call the API, and then this is the payload, lah, okay? So all you need to do is to supply your API key, the messages, the, which is the request, the user messages, as well as temperature. So temperature is something like how random the, the you want the output from ChatGPT to be. Okay, so this is the Python example, okay? So what, what this means is that you can send multiple me messages to the chat GPT because you can, let's say if you have a series of conversations, you can send all of them. So the chat GPT model will have the context of what the conversation is about. Okay, then since we have the API, now we need to make a post request. In modern programming languages, right, it's actually quite easy, right? You call the API function and you just populate with your payload everything. But for an old application like DOS application, right, there's no such helper functions. So if you want to create a post request, right, this is what you have to do, you have to construct it all this by hand, like this, the, the raw payload, okay? And there are two different types of payloads. Uh. So the first payload I use, this is for if you want to send the first message from the user. Okay, for subsequent messages, right, then I'll also send the previous set of requests and reply. Okay, so let me go back there, let me explain this. So, remember you see this, uh, the first question I ask uh, is, what is Junior Dev SG? Then my next question is, who founded it? So how does ChatGPT know uh, that this question is based on the context of the previous request and reply set? It's because I sent the previous request and reply for ChatGPT as well. So you cannot just send the latest one, it cannot track this. Okay, the best way is actually to send the entire conversation history. But if you have a modern system, this is not a problem. But for the DOS system, the memory is not enough. So I cannot keep the whole conversation history. So I only send the previous 
request and reply. This is actually sufficient, if you think about it. It's enough to give you the ChatGPT the context of the conversation. Okay, so after that, we get a JSON reply. How do we pass it, right? So this is an example of JSON reply. Modern language is very easy to pass, right? The, the old way, I, I have no JSON library for this. Right? Okay, so I tried many JSON libraries. Open one call cannot, cannot use them. So I didn't want to find out, find out I'm trying to, try to fix the issue. Right? Okay, so just use a simple C code because all we need to do, right, is actually to extract this content, right? Why do we need the whole JSON library for that? Right, so just manually use C code. Right? So what I do uh, is just, you see, I, I locate the first content string, which is this one, okay? Then I advance the pointer to here, and then I find where the end is. Then just extract out all. Can, can really what? No need JSON library. Uh. <coughs> Why? So it's okay. Uh. Okay, so then the next issue is the HTTPS one. So this is where I got a lot of complaints for. Uh. So I didn't explain. Uh. So HTTPS, right, we take it for granted. It's a security, it's a way of encrypting your communication with the server, right? But we take it for granted that our computers today can actually handle it. But on the DOS PC, right, there's one thing, there's no HTTPS API. Okay, there is no library. So I had to create a proxy to do it. So this proxy is running on a modern PC. So this proxy, when I say modern PC, it doesn't necessarily need to be a desktop or laptop. It can be things like Raspberry Pi, also can. Okay? So I created this proxy that, that helps to upgrade the connection. And it, that's all it does. It doesn't modify the payload in any way. So whatever it receives from DOS PC gives to OpenAI servers. Whatever it gets from OpenAI servers just gives back to the DOS PC. That's all. Okay? So I talked to this guy over email, Michael Bauman, the creator of the MTCP library. He also agrees. You can see that's the external first program. I will also have used a, a proxy to strip the TLS, and we have done in Golang as well. TLS is just not going to happen on DOS. Okay? So uh, I have a follow-up conversation with him. So these are the issues. Uh, if you try to make it run on 60 bit DOS, first thing, there's no a modern TLS library that can run on 16-bit DOS, okay? Even if you can, uh, there's something called difficulty in verification. How are you sure that the encryption library is performing as it should be? And there's no mistakes. It's very difficult to verify that, you know? So these heavy cryptographic algorithms. And the last problem is that of performance. Even you can somehow can do this, you verify the library is working, is it fast or not? Okay? So this, there's a library for old vintage Unix systems, okay? So this is what they say. Uh, some systems may be too slow for present day expectations and thus appear not to function. Okay? In our testing, this starts to become a problem for CPU slower than 40 MHz, regardless of architecture. So they have this PC, and it took 22 seconds eh, for a single TLS transaction to a local test server. And then they tested against a number of internet hosts, and they will just cut the connection. Because your PC is taking too long. They will assume something is wrong, and they time you out. So even if you can make the whole TLS library properly for DOS, right, your system is just too slow already. So it's just not possible on the hardware, right? Okay, then the next problem is there's no multi-threading. So most of the time today, right, we handle network requests on a multi-threaded, a separate thread, right? Because CPUs at that time, they're all single cores, and they're very slow single cores. Okay, so everything single thread. So you need to actually call this MTCP library functions regularly, okay? So that it can manage the network stack for you. Remember, the network stack is no longer managed by the operating system. It's managed by your own application. We take it for granted today, the OS does it, okay? And then, sorry, uh, there's also console input. So you have to do everything uh, on a single thread. Okay, so this single thread brings some issues. So when we try to print the console, if you use the C function of printf, it's okay. The problem now comes is how do you receive the console input from the user? In C, in school, maybe we learn to use scan F, right? In school. But scan F, right, will actually pause the, the whole program because it stores the program waiting for you to press enter. Once it stores, right, your network stack also stores. Right? Then there's a problem. Okay? So we cannot use scan F. So this is actually a, a very low level function, uh, C function, which is actually to call directly the BIOS function to actually check whether the user has pressed a key. If the user has pressed a key here, then I go and extract the key. What is the key value? And I have to store to my local buffer. Okay? Now, this problem doesn't end there, right? How do you handle backspace? Okay? Sorry. So, 
backspace, right? The user press backspace. Also, this is uh, the level, the key for for backspace. So you need to actually remove the previous, move the cursor back, right? Then after you print something, then move the cursor back again. <laughs> very a very low level, uh, okay? And then you store it to the local buffer. Uh. Okay, then another one more problem come out, right? What happens if you don't handle non S key properly? So this is the example here. So here, right? This this is not a S key, not a default S key character, <laughs> right? It's used in like maybe French language like French, uh, okay? If you don't handle properly, this is what will come out. The the PC doesn't know what to do with it. You just print out like directly like that. Why why did, does this happen? It's because of UTF-8. Okay, so JSON it, this is RFC standard. So JSON standard says that you must be encoded using UTF-8. Uh. Okay, do you think DOS supports UTF-8? <laughs> okay. So let, let's just do a recap. What is exactly is UTF-8? So UTF came out in, in 993, but uh, mass adoption came much later, like in, around the millennium time. Okay, so it's a multi-byte encoding. So the first byte is backward compatible with ASCII. Okay, the problem comes with these others, two, three bytes and more. So if you don't handle it properly, right, what the program will do is that you print this as two separate characters. That's where you get the, the problem, uh, like this. Uh, it cannot handle it properly. Okay, so how to handle this? Okay. Okay, so there is a concept called code pages. This is something that predates UTF-8 on, on PCs. Uh. Okay, so for the first 128 characters, ASCII, standard. Okay, but then from 128 to 255, you can see all these characters, right? This is called extended ASCII. It's not really default. Uh. Okay, but this is what the early IBM PC used. So if I want to display this right, I need to conform to this old code page. Okay, how to do manual convert ah. <laughs> I show you ah, uh, it's like, look up table. yeah, look up really, literally it's a look up table. Like that, I have to construct this all out ah. Uh. Okay, because right, you think about it right, it's, online I can find code that can convert from code page 437 to UTF-8, from old to new. Who in the right mind won't try to convert from the new to the old one? <laughs> Okay, so this is the, the I mainly I mainly did it uh. yeah. Uh, I, I try to ask chat GPT to generate for it. It doesn't understand what I'm trying to do. <laughs> so so I had to do it myself. It took me quite a few hours uh, to check this because it's so easy to make mistakes. And this is not a linear order. Uh. So you may think that okay, this is linear order is easy, uh. it's not it jump it jump around. So it, it has to be checked one by one. Okay, to support the French user. <laughs> okay, so let's quickly continue. Okay, so this is the example here. So you see, I solved it so it displays correctly. But there are some UTF-8 characters just not available. Then I just print a, a, a box uh, like this. Right. Okay, then I have a Greek user that asked me. <laughs> okay, so I, uh, this, you see, uh, every different language, right, they have a different code page. So, yeah, I did it for him. So I did the same thing again for him. So it's, uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so I need to push use the command line argument. So for that user, right, he will use dash cp737, then he get the good result, you can see. Okay. So I, I think this I will do on the request. Right? Someone asked, then I will do. It's very tedious. Right? Okay, then another weird issue. So this user, right, he wrote a comment on my blog post. He tried to run on his compact portable. So this PC is something, it was released in 1983. So you see, uh, cannot work. So, I try to simulate everything. I use the 86 box emulator. Then this is what you do. I build a few things. We the risk. I send to him. He copies for me this copy to the PC and they try. Then he takes take photo of the screen. Think of screen sharing, man. <laughs> <laughs> Divide the old-fashioned way. Yeah. Okay. I still cannot uh, troubleshoot why the problem is. So lucky micro problem stayed in. You see what you write. Compact Portable has a slightly funky BIOS that trip out this runtime. So basically, uh, this PC right, is not following a particular standard. How would I know? Uh, is that you don't have the actual hardware, right? There's no way for you to know this. And you can't really Google this thing out because this information right, it only exists in someone's head. Uh. No, it, remember, DOS existed in the era when there was not widespread internet. Uh. So if no one documented it, right, Google sure cannot find it. Chat GP sure don't know one. Right? Well, lucky he tell me. <laughs> 
Okay, so the point is the confidence in the past was not as standardized as it is today. Okay, we take it for granted that we write a program here, it will run on some other PC with, with no problems. Uh, but you cannot say the same for the past. Okay, so this user, right, he actually, one of the users actually used my app, he go to a conference and he show in his SAB. Uh, compact, there was the guy with the compact portable, uh, the 1983 PC. Yeah, so yeah, he took a photo and sent to me. <laughs> So you can see all the other vintage PCs here. It was a conference that happened last week only. <coughs> okay, so someone asked, uh, did I ask ChatGPT to write this app? Uh? Okay, uh, so I could ask, uh, ChatGPT did not help me anyway. Uh. You think his reply is correct or not? You see your SFD. Uh. True. Uh. The next thing is, I use a, use a library like OpenAI Official Python API. Uh. You think that will work or not? <laughs> can the Python library from OpenAI run on the old door system? Uh? Obviously cannot. Uh. Okay, the, the rest is, is quite... Correct? Then it gave me the wizard warning. Keep in mind that it may be challenging. DOS is outdated. You may not have necessary tools and resources to develop modern applications. Okay, so challenge accepted and I win already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so concluding remarks, right? Yeah, achievement unlocked. I, I wrote my first DOS application. Okay, I was honestly surprised at the international attention. There's so many websites covered it. Okay, and there were so many. You would imagine the market for vintage computers is not that big, right? But surprisingly, a lot of people use and they found GitHub issues that tell me, you know, the bugs that my program has. Eh? <laughs> okay, I learned a lot of low-level details like network socket, UTF-8, console handling. So a lot of this, right, is still applicable in today's computing. So it, so it shows you, right, computers have changed a lot in these decades, but a lot of things have stayed the same also. Okay, so how is this useful in modern times, right? So some people ask me why, right? Actually, there is a class of job today, right, where such skills are useful, and that is called the embedded systems engineer. Okay, you can see this guy. Okay, he he commented when I wrote in my Windows 3.1 app three years ago. You, you can read from here, lah. So these are the problems that embedded system engineers face. Yeah, it's a very tough job, I tell you, embedded system engineer. <laughs> it's like programming on systems that are equal to some 20 to 30 years ago kind in terms of difficulty. Okay. So future work or feature requests, I got this. Uh. Okay, the first problem is people tell me uh, the proxy is the most irritating thing. It's not pure, right? Think about it. Your system has to need some other system to run. So there is a way to get past this, to get DLS working. So, but you need to relax certain requirements. So uh, you can use, can you, I can use something like 32-bit DOS extender. So it basically, it's a 32-bit DOS program. Right? It is possible. But your system has to be uh, quite powerful. Uh. So if you have to run it you on know, at least a Pentium 1 system to be useful. Theoretically, a 32 bit DOS as a standard program can run on a 386 PC, but not for the TLS requirements. Right? Because remember, uh, it, on a slow PC, uh, it takes 20 or 40 seconds. Imagine each reply, uh, you add 20 seconds, 30 seconds to it. And ChatGPT already got its own delay. So you won't want to use that. Uh, right? And text to speech. Uh. So someone said you should get it to play the. Play a uh, speech, uh, like the, those like war games, uh, there's an old movie, uh, so you can play, that's more fun. Uh. I mean, maybe I can consider it. Uh. Okay? Yeah, so th that comes to the end of my presentation. <laughs> okay, I can take questions if there's time. If there's time. Uh. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have a bunch of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I scared already. <laughs> uh, so for, for, for people who are interested in the future of computing, what is the future of computing? Connection that you open at the beginning and basically a key open. So, like, you would have to wait 20 seconds just yeah. to get started, but then subsequent round trips could go. I think, yeah. I think that depends on whether the server supports that, that API. Okay, keep, if the if server does not support that, they insist that you close it, right? Then you, you can't do anything. If I'm not wrong, the, the request closes the socket after you finish. Oh, okay. Yeah, for this API. So, you can't do that. Okay, where is the... Yeah, and another thing is the... Even that there's still symmetric encryption. The symmetric encryption could take significant time also, on the, even on the OPC. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, have you thought about using the icon database for the UTF-8 to DOS? Yes, sorry, what, what database? 
So, so icon, right? That's a unique. That's a Linux open source tool that is exactly for this purpose. It's for converting text between. I, I maybe I can try. So uh, they would have a database instead of you know you having to go through the mm. page and then, which, which you could probably easily just convert to a oh, yeah. simple enough format that. Okay. Uh, there's one concern. Uh. So libraries, right? A lot of libraries online, they assume that you are using 32-bit systems. No, I'm not saying you should use the library. I'm saying you should take the database from the library, wow. pre-process them to get your code page uh. <laughs> instead of having to type it in by hand. And if someone comes and says, oh, I want to use it in Hungarian, then... OK, I can consider that. Uh. Yeah, for more. I need to look up. And so, my last <laughs> <laughs> so, so one screen full of text is like 2K, right? And, and, and so you said that you can only send back the previous prompt and the previous yeah. reply. But, but are you really that short? On that? Actually, not, not really short. La. It depends on how much RAM. So, I okay, I put that 64, 640K, right? I was trying to target 256K with, the, with even the MS DOS running inside. So I was a bit hesitant to allocate so much. And the more they allocate, right, there's no such thing called, uh, the data structures are difficult to manage in C. Mm. So I, I, I felt that just setting the previous one is sufficient context. If not, I have to program to like free the previous one and then do this, uh, do this round robin thing, uh, a bit hassle. I have one question. Yeah. Maybe a silly one. Uh, I, I see that uh, you have written this in C, C++, plus, C++ yeah. plus, plus, right? Very, very native code. Uh -huh. uh, is it possible to write this in something which compiles to a native code, like Go? Uh, Go or compiles to a native code. Is it possible to write this? Okay. Do like you know what's the minimum supported uh, x86 CPU for Go or not? I'm not sure. It's Pentium MMX. Uh, okay. I know. I asked this question before. A quiz question to someone. So there's a minimum uh, CPU supported by Go. But doesn't LLVM have an 8086 target? Sorry? LLVM, doesn't it have an 8086 target? I... Because I, last I checked, right, when I Googled, right, there's only this one, there's DJGPP for DOS 16-bit program. So for that, I think don't have. The last I checked, I need to check again. Uh. Can't remember often. Huh? You need to check with the processor architecture whether does it support it and so on. Yeah, but because it's, it's so very old. Really yeah. Okay, there is also another thing, another concern. Why I use OpenWorldCom is because the MTCP library was compiled with OpenWorldCom, so it's better that I follow the same compiler that guy used. Okay. And any more questions? Okay. Then, Michael, that's all. Thanks.